I can't declare open this hearing, this public hearing of the Senate Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport References Committee. The committee is hearing evidence for its inquiry into the road transport industry, and I do welcome everyone here today. This is a public hearing and a Hansard transcript of the proceedings is being made. Uh, before the committee starts taking evidence, I remind all witnesses that in giving evidence that the, you are protected by parliamentary privilege, it is unlawful for anyone to threaten or disadvantage a witness on account of evidence given to a committee, and such action may be treated by the Senate as a contempt. It is also a contempt to give false or misleading evidence to a committee. The committee prefers all evidence to be given in public, but under the Senate's resolutions, witnesses have the right to request to be heard in private session. It is important that witnesses give the committee notice if they intend to ask to give evidence in camera. If a witness objects to answering a question, the witness should state the ground upon which objection is taken. The committee will determine whether it will insist on an answer, having regard to the ground that is claimed. If the committee determines on an answer, or de determines to insist on an answer, I should say, a witness may request the answer be given in camera. Such a request may, of course, also be made at any other time. Now, if you agree to provide an answer to a question taken on notice during the hearing, please note that the answers are due by close of business Thursday, the 10th of December, 2020. I'll say this, but when I'm dealing with truck drivers, they don't have to do that. They're always straight up front. We get the answer straight away. So that shouldn't worry anyone out there. Now, I remind people to ensure their mobile phones are either turned off or switched to silent. Finally, on behalf of the committee, I would like to thank all those who have made submissions and sent representatives here today. Now, it gives me pleasure to welcome representatives from the Transport Workers Union, some via teleconference. So for the Hansard record, could you please, each of you, state your name and the capacity in which you appear today? Uh, thank you, Senator. And um, I'd like to thank the uh, committee for inviting us along here today. Um, uh, Tim Dawson, Branch Secretary of the Transport Workers Union, Western Australia. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, now, Jason, for those that are listening on air, we're having some techni technical dramas here. Have we got none on yet? We've got to chase our truck drivers. I'm sure they'll be dying to, to, to uh, um, put forward their views, so we'll keep punching away at that. I'm joined online by Senator Susan McDonald from Queensland, Senator Janet Rice from Victoria. Thank you, Senators. So, uh, as you will find out through these transport inquiries, they seem very informal because I know everyone. So I'm not being a smarty. Tim, welcome. And we uh, do refer to each other in the names that we've referred to each other for the last 40 odd years, with most of the people around the nation and others. So Tim, I'm going to ask you to make a brief opening statement before we go to questions. The floor is yours. Please get it on the record that you want the senators to hear. Uh, thanks, Len. Um, Senator. Um, yeah, look, I'm, I'd like to, uh, today is more tell a bit of a story about my experience over 30 odd years in the transport industry as a driver, an owner driver, um, forklift operator, organised with the Transport Worker, Workers Union and now currently the Secretary of the West Australian branch. Um, and, uh, you know, and what I've found in all that time is transport workers firstly want to go to work and come home safely as any worker does. The transport workers, um, whether you be an owner driver, a small or large business or rank and file uh, worker, is that you want to make sure when you go to work you have a sustainable job, a safe job. And so, um, you know, currently I think the, I believe the transport industry is um, in, a, in a place where there's a lot of stress on it. There's a lot of stress on it because of um, the pressure that comes from the top of the, um, the transport chain, which is the clients, the big retailers, the mining companies, the fuel companies, the banks, and all these large corporations use transport um, as a way to save money and cut costs. They don't look at transport as what transport is, is to transport their goods and have that done safely. They talk about safety. They talk about that they want compliance, but at the end of the day, it comes to the bottom line and that affects transport workers, whether it be in road 
air, shipping, rail, it doesn't really matter. I mean, transport workers get affected. And especially small operators and owner drivers, I feel that, um, and I'd like to see what comes out of this tribunal is a genuine outcome that makes sure that uh, we have a safe, sustainable industry that delivers true cost recovery for owner drivers, businesses and people on wages get paid a decent day, a decent pay for a decent day's work. Now they all sound, you know, motherhood statements, but it's a fact that our industry doesn't deliver that. Our industry doesn't deliver that because of what I said earlier about the pressure on it from the top of the, the chain. Um, and what it causes, it, it causes, you know, record numbers of small companies to go broke into receivership. What it causes is for us not to have a safe industry, the most dangerous industry in Australia, where more people die in our industry, truck drivers, than is acceptable, that should um, not be classed as a road accident, but is a workplace accident. You know, year to date, around 40 truck drivers have died in Australia. Um, we expect governments to make us safe. We expect governments to have laws and regulations that make people safe, not laws and regulations that um, put more pressure on drivers. You know, ridiculous logbooks in the eastern states that find people for a spelling mistake or using an, some initials to state where they rested. Um, you know, we need to make sure that uh, drivers feel they have worth when they go to work. Um, you know, I mean, you know, I'll, I'll talk about some... And, and where we talk about safety and the pressure on drivers, and some of these are some historical figures, but in 2015, Safe Work Australia reported, reports showed that 31% of employers say workers ignore safety rules to get the job done. That's the employers saying that, 31%. This is not workers. These are the people who direct people what to do, saying people, 31%. The 20% accepted dangerous behaviour compared to less than 2% in other industries. The 20% of transport industry employers break safety rules to meet deadlines. This compares with just 6% of employers in other industries. Now, we're talking about employers here who think that's acceptable. A Macquarie University study showed that one in 10 truck drivers work over 80 hours per week. One in six owner drivers say drivers can't refuse an unsafe load. And 42% of owner drivers said the reason drivers do not report safety breaches was because of fear of losing their jobs. That is not acceptable. It's not acceptable in any industry, but especially in a unique industry like the transport industry where people who work in it mix every day with the general public. They drive on the roads. You know, Trucks that weigh over 150 tonne and are 60 metres long in the northwest of Western Australia should not have to have this type of pressure on them to get the job done. Or in Perth, where you're going to have a 90 to 100 tonne truck and 27 and a half metres in the, on, the, on the road in Perth, um, do not need to have this type of pressure on them to get the job done. Um, you know, the overwhelming operator in the transport industry is professional. Um, they come to work, they do the job, they do everything they can to make sure not only themselves are safe, but the people are around them safe. When the people around them have no idea how to interact with a, tr with a truck, and they do that, and they do it with utmost care. Um, but we have this pressure that causes people to be forced to take shut corners, cut corners. We have companies that use a risk model to get the job done because they feel that for if they do get caught, that at the end of the day, it's worth that risk to try and win contracts. We need to stop that. We need to make sure that 
we have the ability for these people to go somewhere where they can have a model where they can get cost recovery, where they can do it safely and they can report where they have been forced to do an unsafe act. And we're not talking about um, the current system we have, we're talking about a system that is unique to the transport industry, that the transport industry has a place to go, whether we call it a tribunal or whatever we call it, but that is what we need. We need something where, um, whether you're a, 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 a small business, an operator, even a large business, whether you're an owner driver or you're a wage person, you can go directly there and it can be done with no fear that you will be sacked, with no fear that there will be any recourse against you by either a company or the regulators, that you can do that without any fear or favour to make our industry safer, to make it um, more sustainable. So they're the, you know, that's what we really need in our industry. And, 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 and I don't say that for any other reason that experience tells me that that's what we need. Over 30 years in this industry, um, representing workers, representing owner drivers, and um, regulation is not the answer. Continually regulating our industry, where at the end of the day, the only people who it affects are drivers, whether they be owner drivers or rank and file. They are the ones that end up holding the baby. They're the ones that get fined. They're the ones that lose their licenses and lose their livelihood. Now, I'm not here to say if someone does the wrong thing they, that, that the law shouldn't come down on them. But what I'm saying is they shouldn't be the ones that are held accountable when the people at the top of the chain, the retailers, the miners, the bankers, continually put pressure on their on, on, on who they on them themselves, on who they work for, who they contract to, which, you know, the proverbial flows downhill, as we all know, and that's where it goes to. It goes to the per people at the bottom. And I expect, I'm not asking this committee, this inquiry, to do the right thing. We demand they do the right thing. The transport industry, the people I represent, demand they do the right thing here. We demand that you bring in laws, that you bring in some regulations that actually allows people to go somewhere where then people, when they go there, they have recourse, that they actually, it has meaning, that if they're not getting a cost recovery for what they do, that if there's not a sustainable rate that they can demand from the people they work for, then you've failed. That you've failed as regulators, you've failed as lawmakers, and you've failed the people of Australia to have a safer, safer roads. We, and, and, and so, you know, it's not about feeling good about yourselves because you're sitting here listening to someone like me. It's not good enough that you feel good enough that you've made it into parliament and been politicians. We expect you when we vote for you to do something. We expect you today and we're at the end of this to actually make our industry safer. So the 40 to 50 people who die on our roads, transport workers every year, that stops. We need zero tolerance for transport workers when it comes to deaths and injuries. Zero tolerance. And if you can't do that, then move over and let someone in that can do it. Because we demand it. It's time to step up and do it. I'm sick of talking to families of our members who have died on the roads. I'm sick of going to funerals. I'm sick of seeing people who all they want to do is work, that uh, it, it's a death. There will be someone die on our roads driving a truck next week and the week after. So if, if you don't think that's good enough, then please do something about it. And then I'll go to mental health. Mental health in our industry. We all talk about mental health and how bad it is, and it is. It's a terrible thing. The transport industry, in all the figures you see about it, says that 30% of transport workers will, are, or have had a mental health issue. 30%, 30%. There's a couple of hundred thousand truck drivers out there. 
So do the numbers. Do the numbers. That's about 60,000 truck drivers out there with mental health problems. Now, they're not exact numbers, and I haven't got, uh, but that's what we're talking about. We need to do something about mental health. And all the issues we talk about, the pressure on them, as much as not even having a decent toilet to go to when you go down the road and amenities. Come on now. The 21st century? <coughs> Should a driver who leaves Perth on a four or five day trip into the Northwest not have the ability to use a toilet over shower? Do we think that's good enough? In the 21st century? State and federal governments? Step up and put the money in and do something about our amenities. It's time to do that. Make drivers feel like they have the worth to do it. Let's do so. That that alone will help the mental health of truck drivers. So, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions you want. Um, but today, I, I appreciate the opportunity to come along um, to talk on behalf of transport workers and truck drivers here today, the people that we represent at the Transport Workers Union. Um, and I would see. I would like to see nothing more than when this report comes out. And when the re and not only the report coming out, and I know it will say s some things about what should change because that's what all reports do. But how about we do what the report says? Thank you, Senator. Thank you very much, Tim. And as usual, you never leave, leave us wondering what you're thinking. and appreciate that. Now we have been joined by Mr. Kevin Coots via teleconference. Are you there, Kevin? Kelvin, sorry. Kelvin. Yes. Yes, I'm here. Okay, well, I'm going to give you the opportunity to tell us who you are for the Hansard record and in what capacity you appear today. Then, Calvin, I'm going to give you the call to tell us what you would like us to hear. Hi, right. yeah, my name is Calvin Cooks. I work for GKR Transport. I'm a long distance truckie from Perth to Melbourne every week. Uh, two up. M two up, did you say? Yes, I'm a two up driver. And, and Kelvin, that's really great to hear from you. Where do we find you at the moment? I'm um, about, I've oh, just left Ararat, so I'm not far off a couple of hours from uh, my destination at uh, Melbourne. All right, well, we do appreciate your valuable time. Thank you very much. So, Kelvin, if you'd like to give us a brief opening statement, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, I've written down a few things. Uh, cameras. Uh, now, cameras, we talk about mental health, about cameras. Uh, it's just a straight out breach of privacy. Uh, they also have audio unbeknownst to a lot of people. Uh, I worked for uh, Cube Transport a few years ago when they put them in and I had a big disagreement over it and left them. Uh, it's not, it's the privacy thing, it's your banking records, passwords, personal relationships when you're talking to your wife on the phone. All of these things come in, into play and then someone looking at you all the time. And uh, this company here that I work with, GKR, now are talking about putting cameras into our trucks. And I look at it and this truck is my home. I'm out here five, five days, five and a half days a week. I'm only home for a, a day and a half. So I'm now going to be watched by a camera and have a vibrating seat. And they're calling it safety. I'm, I don't know where they get safety from, what, what a camera's going to do. Um, I just think it's outrageous that anyone could watch me drive from Perth to Melbourne and see what I'm doing. That's not, that's not right. Uh, I also I know of people that have been, uh, or good friends that have been fired through cameras, silly things, just uh, one person coming into the yard at Cube through his helmet, onto the dash cam, not even thinking, as he came into the gate, he was sacked for interfering with a safety device on the truck. I mean, this is a family man, had five children, uh, had moved house from uh, north of Perth to south of Perth and uh, was fired. You know, it's just, it's just shocking. It's a workplace bullying tool for the employees. Um, fatigue management, well, <laughs> That's, uh, that's a, 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 a can of worms. Uh, I believe that uh, they've all got it wrong. Um, I think every two hours, you should be out of your truck walking around. Your fatigue, fatigue break should be taken away from a truck, not in a truck. And in WA, every five hours, we get a 20 minute break, but it can be a 10 minute, uh, consecutive time and then you can break up your next 10 minutes into one minute intervals if you want. 
but they, they also say if you're in a traffic jam, loading a truck, uh, all of that type of thing can be classed as a fatigue break. So we're getting the same old story that we're not getting out of our trucks, getting our circulation going, which we know what it causes, blood clots, uh, all the things that we don't hear about, bad hearts, uh, arthritis, knee replacements, just through circulation. So my belief is every, say, two hours, and, and, and let me re in WA, we have, every five hours you have a 20-minute break. So that's, I don't have a problem with that, but it can be in the truck. And that, that shouldn't be the case. That's, that's just terrible. Um, I believe that it should be away from the truck, so we've got that sorted out. I believe it should be 20 minutes, uh, 10 minutes for your first two hours, four hours it should be 20 minutes, thereafter it should be 10 minutes for the next two hours, then half an hour for your next two hours, and so on and so on. So, uh, but away from the truck. Um, uh, what else are we gonna do? Uh, Wages, well, here's a good one. Now, I have been currently driving from Perth to Melbourne with 36 metres of truck, which is two trailers, uh, at 78 tonne. Now, we have just gone to these new, what they call BAB trains, uh, which are 42 and a half metres, and we have uh, 99 Point five ton in weight, which we take into Adelaide, and shortly they told me we'll be going into Melbourne with these long units. Now, I've been doing the trials for them for five weeks, uh, and we are going to be paid no extra, absolutely nothing, to have this uh, these huge rigs on the road that we're responsible for. I find it uh, quite disappointing. Uh, wages from a van driver to a truck driver to a road train driver is minimal. I mean, I, I, I'd have to go back and have a look at the award, but uh, the union people, Tim Dawson, that would probably know, he's probably only looking at 20, 30 cents an hour extra for driving these big rigs. Um, I, I think it's a disgrace, really. Uh, I've been in it for 40 years, and after 20 years of uh, driving, I would consider myself a reasonable driver, a good driver on any combination that you can throw at me. But I'm coming, you know, like I'm 61 now and I think I've had one speeding ticket uh, in all of that time. And, you know, you're talking about cameras for safety. That's just nonsense. My wages are not reflecting my experience and the money that I'm making for my company. I guess that's about all I have to say, really. Calvin, whole, that's... Uh... Look, thanks, Kelvin. Oh, sorry, it's Glenn Stirl here. I'm oh, sorry, I should have said that. And, and we're joined with Senator, by Senator Susan McDonald, Senator Janet Rice. Uh, thanks for that, Kelvin. Right. Well, we'll have some questions. I'll just say one thing, mate, that uh, going from four to, uh, 78 tonne to 95 tonne, that's what they call... 99. No, oh, 99 yeah. tonne, sorry. That's what yeah. a lot of people like to call productivity. Don't belt me up, mate. I'm being real cynical here. <laughs> productivity, yeah. in my view, productivity in the transport industry is how much more of your crap can we cut for nothing? There you go, that's yeah. my view. So, all yeah, right. Well, I, now, do, I, I do 82 hours a week, just that's travelling time. Yeah. Uh, from, it takes me to return to Perth, and 30 hours of that at least would be downtime that I don't get paid for waiting for loads. Yep, and so it's... I'm at about 120 hours a week, roughly. And, you know, that doesn't sink into a lot of people. When you hear a truck driver say that, well, how many hours you're working? And I, I do quote from a conversation I had with Trevor Warner not long ago from Queensland when he said to someone, you know, he was telling him he can earn $2,000 a week to the un uneducated someone said, oh, that's brilliant money being a truck driver. He said, hang on. He said, I've got two jobs. I work 76 hours a week. And we just heard your hours there, Calvin. So um, thanks for that, mate. And I, and I, don't, and I, and I don't get $2,000 a week. I get fifteen hundred dollars. Mm. Yes. So this is the this is the stories we have to hear, and there's no better way of hearing these. The senators need to hear this. That we hear this from the men and women who actually live and breathe this stuff. And we're truckies because we love being truckies. We're not truckies because we're yes. we, we weren't smart enough to do anything else. We actually love the lifestyle. <laughs> we love the job. But by crikey, I tell you what, I'm the first one to say we are very poorly remunerated 
on the whole, when you think about the, when the plumber comes to your house, to your house, if you haven't got 300 bucks in the kit, if you just so he takes your phone call before the ute bulls in the driveway, you ain't going to get a plumber. No disrespect to my mate who's a plumber because he's a good one. But anyway, um, now we are going to be joined at 9:30 by uh, Mr. Gary Deanspread. So is Gary online yet, Jason? He's not online. All right, let, let's go to some questions. I might, what I might do, Tim, is I might go back to Calvin because he's got a probably once you finish, Calvin, I assume you probably want to chuck it in gear and get going again. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, we're on the road now. The oh, you're driving. driving. Okay, so time's not a problem. Look, what I'll do is no. I've got... Good. I've got other senators that are on the line, and I want to give my colleagues a chance because I'll go all day on this. So, Senator McDonald or Senator Rice, is there any questions you want to ask of Mr Dawson or uh, Mr Coots at this stage? Because I know your time's short. Chair, it's Susan McDonald. I will have questions, but I know that Senator Rice time if she'd like to go first. Senator Rice, did you have anything? Oh, look, thanks. Yes, I did. Thanks. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Senator McDonald, for letting me go first. And thank you very much, Mr Dawson and Mr Coots, because as as um, Senator Stell just said, hearing your stories and the reality of what life's like for the um, truckies and the, the transport industry is so important. What I wanted to... I mean, clearly there is a problem with reimbursement with conditions. We've been hearing this, you know, I've been in the Senate for over six years and when I joined the Senate in 2014, it was, I think, the time when the, the tribunal was in existence and then it got removed by the federal government. Um, is there any other answer other than having something like that safe rate tribunal to actually legislate to say that truck drivers need to be paid properly if we're going to have safe working conditions? Is, is, you know, is there any other way of doing it or is that that's the fundamental primary thing that needs to occur? What am I doing, Senator Ross, is go to Senator... Uh, go to, I, I just demoted you, Tim. I called you, we can call you Senator <laughs> Dawson, sorry. I'll go to Tim, who's the Secretary, to, because there's two parts to your question, I think, Senator Rice, when we talk about the remuneration tribunal as owner drivers, and then you talked about truck drivers' right wages. So, Tim, do you want to have a crack at that? Thank you, I'll, I'll leave uh, comment on that one. Um, yeah, look, um, yeah, I mean... You mean the demotion? We need something. Now, let's say... We use the word tribunal um, without a debate about what it should be called. But we do definitely need some, a, a, a place that transport truck drivers can go to, whether they're wage people or whether they're uh, owner drivers, or, the, or that they own a fleet of trucks. Um, when Excuse me, Chair. Chair, it doesn't seem like Mr Dawson's microphone's on. It's very oh. faint. Well Sorry, Senator Rice. We haven't even got the video screen, so you can't... Oh, we're all good to go. Okay, okay is that better? Right, um, yeah, so, as I say, it, it, you know, I'm not going to get caught up what we should call it, and I don't think we need a debate about what we call it, we just need it, um, is that we need somewhere where when someone is being unfairly paid, when somebody is being forced to work unsafely, um, that they can take them complaints to, to, to a body that has the teeth and has the ability to enforce it. Now, um, you know, do we, do we need what we call a safe rate? What we need is a safe transport industry. And what we need to make sure is that people, when they're remunerated, that they recover all their costs. Whether that cost is their wages, their bank loan and to be able to maintain their truck in a safe manner, then that's what they need to be able to do and go and, and, and do that. And if we don't do that, if we don't have a place for them to go, then we'll continue to have unsafe trucks on our roads, we'll continue to have an unsafe industry and we'll continue to have too many truck drivers dying on our roads. Um, and look, I, I mean, there is, you know, we, we can talk to 10 people and we'll have 10 different answers about what that might look like. But I think that the, 
you know, what you need, I mean, it's really, what, what, is, a, what, what is a safe cost recovery? And, you know, you'll have, you have five different trucks and you may have five different costs, but at the end of the day, there is a still a cost to run that, that, that or them trucks safely. And there's still a cost for them to have cost recovery. You know, I mean, transport, owner drivers, the majority of owner drivers, when they retire, won't have any superannuation. Why do we not have superannuation when it's compulsory for every employee or every employer to play their employees and yet owner drivers, it's not compulsory for them to be able to put their nine and a half or whatever percent in, into a superannuation fund. So when they retire, they have a superannuation fund to, to retire with some dignity. Why is it that we think that, a, that if you're an owner driver, you shouldn't earn enough money to be able to put food on the table and pay your loan and put a roof over your head, that you have to take, you may may have to take risks to do that, whatever that risk looks like. So, and the uniqueness of our industry means that we need a body that makes sure that that happens. Um, so how that looks, yes, I, I, you know, I mean, you know, I can talk to you for the next two days about how I think that looks, but how it should look is that it's a, a body that has teeth that can enforce a big retailer, a bank, a miner to pay their contractor that they contract to the right amount of money to make sure the person that they engage underneath them gets paid the right amount of money and so on down the chain till the person on wages or the single subcontractor that works for that anywhere in that chain gets, the, gets what they need to be able to recover their costs. And that's, and I don't think that's too much to ask. No, it sounds like a fair enough ask to me. Can I just ask you again, have you been in the business yet? Uh, did you, okay, yes, um, Mr. Cook, if you wanted to respond uh, back to. Yes, and also remember that owner drivers employ drivers. So the flow on effect is terrible. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so the drivers get even, <laughs> even yeah. shorter shrift. Yes, what I wanted yes, to know is, I mean, both of you have been in the industry for a long time. Um, I was pretty new, you know, up to these issues back in 2014. I certainly wasn't convinced by the government's arguments then that uh, the tribunal wasn't necessary. But, you know, their argument was, well, it's not necessary and we can do other things to improve safety for the drivers and the community. What has the experience been like in the, the six years since? Has things improved with regards to safety for truck drivers? No. Yeah, Tim Dawson, no, no it I... hasn't. Um, and uh, there's been no evidence that it has. If anything, the evidence shows that it's, that, 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 that it's got worse. Um, you know, there's been no improvement on payment times. You know, we have owner drivers in Western Australia and maybe in other parts of Australia, no doubt, that can wait 120 days to get paid, 90 days, 60 days. That's, you know, I mean, that we, we, I mean, we can't even bring a, a law in that makes sure that, you know, a small operator um, or even a large company mm. gets paid on time. I mean, you know, I mean, uh, how does someone that, if, if I'm a, 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 a long distance operator, a single operator going into the nor Northwest, I may be spending five to ten thousand dollars on fuel on that trip, yet um, I'm going to wait a and pay cash. Fuel companies don't give you any 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 leniency. They want they want the money before before you, you get the fuel. And um, I may have to wait in, in, in 120 days, but I'm spending that weekly or fortnightly on fuel and building up that. I mean, can you imagine the credit that these people have to run? The debt they get yep. into, um, you know, and we we can't even do something as simple as as, as enforce p t p t payment times. So, you know, we need a tribunal or a body that that can enforce that. Calvin, did you want to add anything to Senator Rice's question there? Um, not really. There has been no changes in safety other than putting cameras or pulling. That's all they've done. It's, it's done nothing for this industry, but stress drivers out. Um, as I've told you, I left one company because of the cameras. I've also told this company that they can take a jump too. I've, I won't put up with it, and many of us won't. Uh, we'll just move on to the next uh, place of employment. It has no cameras. Mm. So, so that you can't even... There's, there's no, no argument. Just, 
if you argue with them, they just come back to your safety, safety. Well, where's the safety? I, I don't understand. The camera's not driving the truck. Um, yeah. And then it goes back to a committee or you try to, you've got nowhere to take it. You go to the union, the union says, well, they just say safety. We have nowhere to take it to be heard. I, 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 it's just terrible. Yeah, I mean, what what I hear you saying is that is that they're sort of doing things in the name of safety, but they're not under uh, not addressing the underlying issue, which is basically making sure that truck drivers get paid properly and have decent conditions of decent work conditions. Yes, and I know no one else has a camera in the house watching them five and a half days a week, which is going to happen to me. Hmm. Um, Mr Dawson quoted the statistic which was uh, yeah, really shocking of 30% of transport workers having a mental health problem. Do you think things like having you know, that surveillance and the cameras and the pressures of work, are, are they you know, really big contributing factors, do you think, towards the, as to why transport workers have got mental health problems? Oh, 100% yes. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. Kelvin, um, Senator, is, um, you know cameras on you 24-7 uh, with the threat of being sacked if, um, you know, it, it, you, you do the simplest of things that the, the, that company may see of a, a breach of safety. Um, we're not talking about doing things that are unsafe, but, you know, we, I mean, um, you know, our organisation are representing people every other day because of some, you know, power hungry manager wants to use it as to, to make an example of someone because they had a blue with them in the lunchroom or something and then go through days and weeks of footage to try and find something that a driver's done that, that hasn't caused a, a, a one issue with that company or, or one incident out on the road. So there needs to be um, some sort of code of conduct in Australia about how these companies use these cameras and uh, or change legislation, one of the two, um, you know, uh, you know, I mean, there's telematics and um, technology and trucks that no doubt are making the transport industry safer. And I'm, I'm, I'm not saying it doesn't, but we need to make sure that it's either used for training or safety and not for dysentery and definitely not for some, some, you know, someone that just has a barney with someone in the lunchroom wants to go and find an issue to sack them on. I mean, that's what we've got to stop. And it definitely causes <laughs> mental health issues. Absolutely. Yeah. So that, look, just one last comment um, rather than the question before I, I hand back. Um, Mr Kurt, you mentioned that you get paid, paid 1500 a week. I just did the sums. If you're working 82 hours, that's $18 an hour. If you add in the 30 that's... hours of downtime, that's $13 an hour. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's not hard to do the sums, is it? <laughs> no. Do you, think, do you think Australians need to know and be aware of that's what the truck drivers that they depend upon to travel all carry their stuff around the country are being paid. <laughs> I, I wouldn't tell too many people you won't get any more drivers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> true. Uh, we, true. We, need, we need to attract young drivers. But going back to that cameras, I, I believe the front cameras that uh, look at the road and see what's happening on the road, I believe that's not a bad thing. Uh, so if there's a crash or if there's an incident, it can be documented. But an internal camera, no way. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Senator Rice. Thank you. Now, now Tim, you wanted to uh, add something? There. Yeah, I'll just say one, a bit you. more to that. Um, you know, in regard to the wages and that, I mean, we definitely need our, award, our awards varied, especially our long distance award. We need it to be varied that kilometre rates aren't the predominant rate that is used in our industry. And we also need to make sure that all unload and load time times are paid for. And then we need to look at the remuneration that drivers get for the hours they work and make sure, and look, our industry is in a crisis when it comes to finding truck drivers. We can't attract young people into our industry for a number of the reasons we've spoke about here today and many others. We can't attract, and, and then uh, when we do it, finally attract people into it, the training is second rate. It doesn't deliver professional, highly skilled people into our industry. We have, you know, I'm not saying the people in it aren't, they definitely are that, but it's after years of, ex of experience, 
but we need to be able to deliver people into it. We need to have career paths for people who want to come into our industry so that they have a, a proper career path like an apprenticeship. And until we do that, we're going to have hundreds, if not thousands, of drivers short to get in trucks. And, you know, you won't be getting your lattes or your iPhones if we can't get enough truck drivers. Right, I think I've, I think Senator Rice has finished now. It, it does give me great pleasure that we've now got, uh, we're now being joined by Mr. Gary Dean, spread by a tally conference. Gary, are you there, mate? You saying, Glenn? How are you? Oh, mate, I've got to tell you, mate, I'm like a, a rat with a gold tooth. I put my tie on today specifically because you were coming and Ray Pratt was here. So at least Ray's seen me in a tie. <laughs> So, and I haven't worn one for a while. Um, Gary, look, just for the purposes of hands up, mate, I'd like you to uh, yes. just introduce yourself, tell us what capacity you appear today. Then I'm going to get you to do an opening statement, mate, a brief one, so we can go to questions. Yes, for sure. Um, <clears throat> Gary Deesby is my name. I've been an owner driver, <clears throat> excuse me, for approximately 40 odd years. Um, gave up 10 years ago. I've since been a wages driver for a large company. But I'm also a trainer and assessor involved in transport logistics, travelled all over Western Australia uh, to mining centres, major centres, industrial centres. Um, and I have a passionate interest in the future of this industry because I haven't listened to all the previous conversations, but I'm probably uh, pretty well aware of what uh, all the issues that guys have raised in front of me. All right, now, Gary, there's one thing you left out there because I remember I was there the night when you received the award for Driver of the Year, too. Oh, yeah, yeah well... Yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> thanks, Lynn. <Ben. laughs> thanks, Lynn. Now I've got to go keep the suit and tie on. Yeah. <laughs> All right, now, Gary, thanks for that. Now, I'm going to go to question... Uh, sorry, to an opening statement, mate. And you touched on 40 years as an owner-driver and, and, and very highly yes. regarded in the industry and now as a rank-and-file employee. So tell us what's wrong with the industry and what would you do if you were the minister who could fix it, mate? Um, look, <clears throat> training across the board, uh, I caught a little bit of the previous speaker's comments and I agree with them 100%. We've got a huge influx of new drivers into the industry. Unfortunately, because of the... Um, COVID-19 situation, here in WA we're not getting drivers from over east to New Zealand like we have in the past, which hasn't been a bad thing. We've got, well in my own personal experience I've noticed recently in the last 12 months large influx of untrained and unskilled younger drivers into the industry. There is, as we're all well aware, there is no proper training or mentoring system within the big companies or even the smaller companies. It's very easy for a, an individual to go and do a preliminary driving course, get an MC licence and then all of a sudden look at me, I'm on the road in charge of a very large combination travelling up the road at high speed. You cannot put experienced heads on younger shoulders. So the big issue from my point of view is training, um, which I think is something that's been lacking in the industry as long as I've been in it. So Gary, I want to, I want to and, and thanks for that, and I want to pose a question to you because uh, you and I were both owner drivers yes. together at the same time um, before yes. I hung up the riding boots. So Gary, and you're a couple of generations of uh, 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 truck drivers, the Dean Spreads, why are you no longer an owner yes. driver? You win lotto? Uh, <clears throat> when it's extremely hard for an individual single owner operator to work effectively or to make a living working effectively for the large companies. Um, the economics of scale come into play. Um, to quote some of the comments I had from companies I worked for previously, if I questioned something, the comment was, there's the rate and there's the gate. Mm -hmm. There's 20 other guys that are prepared to do the job. As we all know, there's a huge turnover of guys that leap into this industry, exist for a couple of years, and then <coughs> unfortunately go tail up leaving financial dramas for everyone involved because it's an extremely easy industry to get into, extremely hard to operate in and getting harder as an individual single owner operator. The biggest problem that I see, and this is now on the other side of the fence working for a large company, they employ small fleet operators who've got access to better finance and better facilities than an individual operator. 
You can buy eight or ten trucks, employ ten or twelve drivers, get away with paying them less than favourable rate wages, operating in our conditions, and subsequently that allows them to compete for and cut with subcontractor rates. So, so Gary, when when you were out there, and and, and as you yes. said, ten years ago. And uh, we used to uh, um, have some arguments about rates regularly, but we didn't yes. have. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. We didn't have the the situation so bad here, but I've picked up now that now we have owner drivers who have purchased a second, third, and fourth truck. So, Gary, are those owner drivers, to the best of your knowledge, working on subcontractor rates to these companies, or are they entities on their own and they set their own rate? Glenn, the only person who would know that would be the person who, who would have access to their records. Um, I can go and buy half a dozen trucks, sit down with any of the big companies, agree to work for above award rates, sign off on that. I get paid that as the prime contractor. If I employ a driver and he's happy to work for less than award rates because he doesn't know any better or he's desperate to get into the industry or possibly... He is of a situation where he might not qualify to work for one of the tier one companies or a tier two company, but he's quite happy to work for a tier three, tier four company where the wages and conditions aren't as good as what he'd get working for one of the big four or five. And then you've got a situation where the owner or the employer could happily say, yep, I'm getting paid the right money, but what he's actually paying his employee, the only person who knows that is his accountant and the ATO. Yes, but I think, you know, it's, it's, I, look, I always say this, Gary, and, and to Calvin, you're still online there. Uh, it's always dangerous to assume in this situation, but I think I'm on pretty safe ground here, and I, and I will assume. If we've got qualified, and there's, there's, don't worry, there's a few grey hairs in this room. Got, there's, there's, there's a couple hundred years of experience sitting in this room here now, I'm telling you, and there's only about four of us, though. OK, but um, for those who have carved out a niche running between Perth and the north of Western Australia, where predominantly subcontractors played a major role. There were fleets of company drivers, we know. Um, but if subcontractors with all those years of experience are now rank and file drivers, I think it's pretty safe to assume that those guys who are out there now are working well below yeah. a rate that we were probably getting when we were doing it. And I'd be very happy if anyone was was able to correct me on the northwest. So, Gary, how far off the mark are we? Back? Where are we going? What's going to happen? We can't get young people in. You know this. You spend a lot of time training young people. If they sit here and listen to these set of inquiries by five o'clock in the afternoon, they'd say, and you wonder why we don't want to go into the industry. So how do we attract young people in, mate? And, and that's to you too, Tim. Yeah, Glenn, um, firstly, the conditions on the road, which has probably been touched on by previous speakers, um, we're still working in 1950 conditions. To give you an example, between Kew and Mikasara, which is roughly, as you know, four and a half, five hours north of Woburn, where most of, most of the drivers who leave Woburn have to pull up for their five hour break, in that 110 kilometres, there's three truck bays on the left hand side. I was coming north, oh, sorry, I was coming south last night. On my fatigue hours, as soon as they expired, I had to bypass two truck bays with a chocker box full of trucks to find a convenient, safe spot to park. When you pull into these truck bays, as we all know, what do you got? 200 metres of gravel and that's it. If you've got to use the facilities, it's, uh, you know, nearest salt bush or mulga bush and that's it. A lot of young guys will look at that and go, well, hell, this is 2021. I'm not going to put up with those conditions. And, and what we should also... If I could just, if I could just add to that, a lot of the sites that we deliver to, not only myself but other companies, other drivers, you can spend four or five hours in the heat and dirt and dust unloading, unstrapping, untying and reloading and get to the gatehouse and there's not even facilities to wash your hands, let alone have a, a clean-up, use a toilet, have a shower. You've got to drive maybe two, three, four hours to reach a roadhouse and hope that you know everything is functioning so you can get yourself cleaned up. But, you know, that's, that's absurd in this day and age, given the huge volume of traffic that we've got going in and out of these sites and the obvious uh, access to good facilities that all these companies have. 
And for those listening, Gary runs triples between Perth and the Pilbara, but we've also got Calvin online, Gary, and Calvin's with GKR running east-west. Uh, BAB double, I think, is the next one you're going to, Calvin. And I and I'll just uh, say... BAB, yes. BAB. And, and, and yep. is it much better between Perth and the eastern states? We have uh, truck bays line with uh, uh, asphalt and toilets and showers and... What's it like out there, no, mate? No, no. No, it's not that great. Uh, Perth to Northland, the road from really Perth to Coolgardie is a disgrace. It's probably a bit years ago we used to, you know, the old road Welbing was, I think, was one of the worst roads in Australia. Well, that road that I run is close to it. Um, they're doing a little bit of work there from uh, Southern Cross back to Perth, but Southern Cross to Coolgardie is terrible, narrow gutted. You know, probably a foot each, a foot of between each uh, before you run off the road or hit a truck. Um, yeah, it's pretty bad. The road houses, yeah, not too bad until you get out, say, to 90 mile. Then you it's sort of four, every four hours you've got a road house. Uh, but generally speaking, it's really just very similar to the northwest. But the roads are better now in the northwest. I still go to Port Hedland every now and again. Uh, I'm quite surprised how well the roads are there now uh, compared to Eastern States. Uh, the roads are shopping. Right, so... Victoria is just terrible. Yep, and, and that came out loud and clear yesterday and it's come out loud and clear in the Albury hearing and the Brisbane hearings as well. And I don't wish to sound crass, but I think we should throw the challenge out to our parliamentarians that when you rock into Parliament House, whether it be state or federal, stick a toilet roll under your wing, make sure it's night time and there's mozzies and shine a torch and go out to the bush. I bet they'd be shocked here in that, wouldn't they? So why do Australia's truck drivers have to live like that? It is 2020. OK, now on that, guys, I want to come back Tim, I want to come back to you. Did you wish to add anything on the truck based or what? Oh, well, it was about how do we attract young drivers into our industry, I think was the original question. And, um, and look at all the things that Gary and Kelvin just talked about, um, you know. But just quickly on the amenities, um, you know, we shouldn't be talking about where there's no amenities. The, you know, there shouldn't even be a discussion in the 21st century. We should just have amenities for truck drivers to stop and go to the toilet. We shouldn't be talking about it. Um, you know, I mean, it, it just it makes me angry, actually, that we have to sit here at a Senate inquiry and talk about... Talk about... <laughs> sorry. I mean, like, we're pretty open. Someone people. just walked in. Uh, <laughs> that we shouldn't have to talk about, um, you know, truck driver amenities. I mean, everyone should be angry about it. Everyone. We should just park the trucks up. Don't leave town until they get some toilets for them. I tell you, it'll take five minutes and they'll fix it. That's the problem. Let's park them up. And so until you get us a shit house, excuse the French, we're not going anywhere. I mean, you know, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. But anyway, attract the, attract the young... I would encourage you to watch the language. There's truck drivers present. I know. Um, 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 Attracting young people into our industry or attracting people into our industry that want to change careers. Um, let's, let's firstly turn it into a career. Let's firstly have a pathway for young people when they leave school to come into our industry. Let's make sure that if, 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 if I want to be a, if I want to get to the transport industry, when I leave school, I can go and work somewhere. I mean, you know, we have logistics and transport. We just don't have truck drivers. Let's use the whole industry. You know, if I want to get into it, maybe I go and work at Woolies or Coles DC and I'm a picker, I get into a forklift. Then as, I, as, as my career goes, I then go to a transport yard and then I get into a small truck and go and maybe drive, become a courier, drive for a courier company. Then I become a, a rigid driver and then I work my way through to, uh, at the end of the day, I may well be, want to come a, a road train driver in the Norwest, driving a 60 metre truck weighing 150 tonnes. Let's turn, let's do that. Let's be serious about what we need to do to um, fix the shortage of drivers and have a career path. Let governments put some money in to assist companies and young people to leave school and do it. Let's educate young people about what a great industry we have, where people can work in our industry. Long distance truck drivers can work, earn 150 or $180,000 a year if they work for a good company. Right, they work hard for it, but they can do that. They can pay a mortgage, put a house, 
educate their kids and put food on the table. That's what they can do and they've been doing it for over a hundred years. What I'm saying is we need to attract people. We need to make people believe that our industry is what it is on them good, good things. There are a lot of good things about it and there are a lot of bad things about it, but let's have a career path for young people. And until we do that and get serious about it, we're going to continue to have a shortage of truck drivers. Look, Tim, thanks for that. We are running close to the clock now, but there's one question I wish to put, and Kelvin, thank you so much for being online, but Gary, there is one question I want to put to you, and I'll be putting it to Ray later today too, and I'll be putting it to Yogi. Now, I've been one of these ones for all the years I've been in the transport industry. I have firmly, and nobody will convince me otherwise, that I know that remuneration and safety go hand in hand. Now, there are some people out there that are arguing. There was someone who put, there was an operator here in Perth who put a submission in today who reckoned that wasn't the case. It's, it's not true. I invited him to attend. He didn't want to attend. Did he refuse? He just couldn't make it. This one here. And he refused. He refused, which saddens me because I really want to challenge him. He, he's got a company down south and he's got 40 or 50 owner drivers working for him. And I wanted to know his history as a truck driver, not as a owner of a company. So Gary, last question, mate, and the last person on the line for this session. Is it just me or as an owner driver, mate, is remuneration and safety hand in hand for our predominantly long distance truck drivers? So definitely, Glenn, because if you're, if you're earning $10 an hour, you've got to work 100 hours a week to make a living. If you're earning $45 an hour, you don't have to work 100 hours a week to make a de de decent living. It's, it's basic economics 101. Thank you on that, Gary. Calvin, as a company driver, would you agree with that or disagree? Yes, 100%. But I'd like to add one thing. We had a, a, a son and a father team turn up here a few months ago and they worked for us for two weeks. They had to sack them because the young fellow, I think he was 22, he couldn't get insurance. The company couldn't get insurance for him. Mm -hmm. So he was sacked. They were sacked. Uh, so how do you train young fellows up? Oh, well, I couldn't understand that mentality. The insurance companies need to have a good hard look at themselves too. That was mentioned yesterday too, and that's not, that hasn't missed me too, Calvin. Oh, I can guarantee you that. Uh, gentlemen, look, I'm so sorry we have run out of time, and I've been told by Senator McDonald uh, uh, I've got to keep an eye on the clock. Can I thank you very much, Tim, for your effort today? To Calvin and Gary, champion guys, stay safe out there. And Gary, if you pass by young bloke, give him a nudge and tell him to get home. His mother wants to say hello. Will do. Don't worry. Thank you. See you, Gary. Thank you. Thanks, Calvin.